we want to take this opportunity again on this gorgeous Sunday morning to welcome you to our online platform here at Discovery Point. And again, our prayer is that us bringing these messages to you uh, in this way is encouraging you, uh, challenging you, and, and just helping you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. Well, this weekend, we're just moving uh, further and further into this idea of the exchange life. And today, uh, Pastor Rod has a powerful message for us out of uh, Romans uh, chapter 6. So I invite you to, to find your Bible if you don't have one there with you or use your phone or tablet, whatever you use to engage God's Word during our time. Uh, go ahead and take a moment and find that and let's get ready to go into a time of worship and then receiving God's Word this morning. Let me pray for our time together. Father, we thank you for this time to be together and we're asking that uh, your Spirit will move in our hearts and our lives as we engage with worship and then as we receive the word this morning father that we pray that that word uh, is bringing forth fruit for the kingdom i pray for those watching this video father that you encourage them and that they are challenged with this idea of the exchange life and that all of us step further and further into your purposes in the person of jesus father we ask this in your name amen god bless you In this time of desperation but All we know is doubt and fear but There is only one foundation We believe, we believe And in this broken generation when all is dark, you help us see And there is only one salvation We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthem. Greater than the songs we sing In our weakness and temptations We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion We believe that He's conquered death We believe in the resurrection And He's coming back again We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion We believe that He's conquered death We believe in the resurrection And He's coming back again We believe We believe Yes, we believe Son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my power.
reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness stretches to the sky your righteousness is like a mighty mountain As you know, we've been spending some time in Romans uh, looking at the exchanged life. And as I was thinking about this evening, I thought about my, my birdcage here and, and how the Christian life is a lot like the bird in the birdcage. You see, this, this bird has been in this birdcage for all of his life. This is his home. And everything that happens within the confines of this, this birdcage, well, it's, it's natural to the bird. He, he's comfortable in the cage because he's never been out of the cage. He, he eats in the cage. He, he sleeps in the cage. He, he squawks in the cage. He flies around in the cage. It's natural. It's nature. And it's home. And so it's natural for the bird. Now, if I were to approach the cage and just, just simply open the door, well, the bird, would, would, he would back up, and he would run away from me. And he would flutter, and he'd flee, and he'd tweet and, to get away from me because he doesn't know me, even though I know him. And I've invaded a space that is comfortable to him. But what if I, what if I opened the cage and, and lovingly reached down and grabbed the bird and, and, and took him out of the cage and took him into my backyard where there are trees galore and other birds and branches and I, I, I sat him on a branch somewhere and I sat him on a branch and he was able to see the trees in the sky for the first time. To flap his wings and realize that the possibilities are endless because he is now free. Free from the confines of a cage. And he now has freedom. This little analogy is very much like the Christian life today. I love what, what, what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul's last letter before he was beheaded, when he is writing to his protege, and he tells Timothy this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. He says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps... If, perhaps, God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil 
having been held captive by him to do his will. This was us. Ensnared in a cage. Held captive by Satan and sin to do his will. And you know what? We did it willingly. Because it's all that we knew. It was natural. It felt good to worry about me, myself, and I. Until one day Jesus showed up. And exchanged the life that I had for a life that I just can't explain. And this is the exchanged life that we have been investigating for the past few weeks. And if you have a Bible, will you turn with me to Romans chapter 6? Bible, phone, iPad, whatever it is, Romans chapter 6, where we are discussing again the exchanged life. That life beyond the cross. And if you've been keeping score, you would know that we have exchanged death for righteousness. That we have exchanged hostility with God for peace. That we've exchanged condemnation because of our sin for grace. We've exchanged hopelessness, Paul has said, for, for hope. And we've exchanged dissension for reconciliation. And last week we saw when Pastor Ron was preaching that we've exchanged Adam for Jesus. And last week Pastor Ron explained what has to be one of the most profound aspects of the great exchange or the exchange life. And that's this, is that God has moved us, he has rescued us from a life of sin and death and placed us into a life of grace and righteousness. We saw last week that sin no longer has control over us. That we are no longer bound to sin. Amen. And I love what Jesus says that he's talking to the religious leaders in John chapter 8, verse 34. When he tells them this, it says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you're what? Do you believe that today? That if Jesus has set you free from sin and death, then you are truly free? Do we live that way? Is the bigger question. Do we live like we're free? Do we even know that we're free? And Paul said this last week in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. He says that where, where, grace about, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Look at the screen. It says this. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, purpose statement, as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says that where, where sin abounds, that grace superabounds. And this is good news, right? Amen. Amen. But you know, for, for some of us, maybe not in this room, we, we tend to live like it's okay for us to keep on sinning because God will keep on giving us grace. And then people see us, and they, they begin to wonder, why should I change why should I come after this Jesus when you're doing the same things that I'm doing? And this is concerning to Paul. And Paul wants to address this issue in the Roman church, and he wants to address this issue in our lives today. So if you will, look, at, look with me. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, where Paul is going to give us four truths concerning this new life. And the first one is simply this. We are dead to sin. We are dead to sin. Look at Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? 
may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Paul asked a rhetorical question. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? May we, should we continue living a sinful life even though Jesus has justified us and he has died for us and he has shed his blood for us? Should we continue to live a life of willful, continual, ongoing sin so that we can see God lavish us with more and more and more grace? The answer to that is absolutely not. And then look at what he says in verse 2. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How can those of us who belong to Jesus Christ, who've been saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, set apart to do good works, how shall we still continually live a life of sin? The answer is we shouldn't. But some of us, maybe not in this room, but some of us do. We live lives of willful sin, knowing that God is going to be gracious to us. And Paul says, if you're doing that, to stop doing that. How can you live that way when you were dead to sin? Paul says. He says, you have died, past tense, to sin. Sin no longer has power over you. Sin no longer reigns over you. You were dead to it. And I understand this, that there are those within the Christian church, generally speaking, who say things like, well, I was born this way. And they, 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 they have this idea that God's will is contrary to his word. And isn't that a song, I was born this way? Who sings that? Yeah, and it, the, the message is, I am who I am. This is how God made me and get over it. And there are believers in the church today who who believe this and who live this way, that this is their authentic self and that I can never, ever change. So accept me for who I am. And they deny the power of the Holy Spirit who has the power to make us new and to make us more like Jesus. And he is doing that in our lives if you belong to Jesus. I remember a couple years back, there was an an opportunity for ministry here. And as I was was talking with the couple that wanted to start this ministry, I had to say no. The reason being is, in this particular ministry, they kept on telling those involved in the ministry that they were sinful and that they were sinners and that they would never, ever overcome this particular sin. Which is a lie. Because the Holy Spirit has the power to change you and to change me. And so I don't know what you're struggling with today. Is anger issues? Money issues? Is it homosexuality? Is it adultery? Is it lying? Is it gossip? Whatever it is, we're dead to it because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And the Spirit can do a marvelous work in us if we simply let him and stop denying his power. Does that make sense? And so Paul says that we are dead to sin. So how can we continue to live a life of sin? And we shouldn't be living a life of ongoing, regular sin. And can I make a confession? Just, I sin each and every day. Can I say that? See, I get up every morning at the crack of dark to go to work. And I drive the I-10 from from Surprise all the way into Tempe. And I like the HOV lane. You know, and I just, I can cruise. But then, like Paul mentioned, when the law came, sin increased. 
And when I see that sign that says 65 miles per hour, speed limit, and I look down and my indicator says 80, I have a choice to make. I can choose to, to pull over into the, the not HOV lane and drive 65 miles an hour. Or I can choose to stay where I am and willfully break the law. And I got to tell you, there is much confession each and every day that I go into the office. Because the Spirit makes me well aware that you're breaking the law. And there, there are consequences to breaking the law, Rod. You haven't got caught yet, but there may come a day when you do get caught, when those lights come on behind you, and you fork over 250 something dollars to the government. Here's the point. We choose to sin. Sin is powerless over us. We die to it. It no longer has a hold on us. And so we should be living lives today that bring God honor and glory. Sin is a choice. And yes, I choose to stay in the HOV lane where the traffic is flowing. But don't think I'm not convicted. And should I ever get a ticket, I'll be over in this low line. <laughs> but here's Paul's first truth, is that we are dead to sin, brothers and sisters. Here's the second truth. We have a new life. Look at verses 2 and 3, 3 and 4 with me. Paul says this, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. Paul says, don't you know do you not understand that as many of you, as many of us who have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death? Now, this is not water baptism. Contrary to what many often preach here in the area, this is a baptism of identification with Jesus. And Paul says that God has baptized us into the death of Christ. And so Jesus died on the cross, and they put him in the ground. And he died for our sins. But then he, he was also raised again. And look at what Paul says. that we have been baptized not only into his death. Here's the purpose. In order that, just as he having raised Christ out of the dead through the glory of the Father, thus even we in newness of life might walk. It's subjunctive in the Greek text. Here's what that means. We might walk in newness of life, and we might not walk in newness of life. The choice belongs to us. It's like when we go to Vegas. We, we might win that million dollars, and we might not. It's a gamble. It's within the realm of possibility. What we do, how we live, but what we know is true is simply this is that we have been identified with Jesus Christ. We have been baptized into his death so that we might walk in a newness of life. Amen. No more sin, no more death, grace and righteousness. We are no longer, guys, in Adam. Right. But we are now living our lives in Jesus Christ, and we are now living a new spiritual reality. Amen. But do our lives reflect that? Is the question. Do our lives reflect our new spiritual reality? Paul tells the, the church in Corinth this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things 
passed away, behold, pay attention, listen, new things have come. We are not the same. Our life is qualitatively different in Christ. And I hope our lives look different today than they did pre-Christ. Everything has changed for us. The old way of doing things, the old way of thinking, the old way of living, it's dead. And now we have this opportunity to walk in, in a new way, in newness of life, to do things the way Jesus did them, to say things the way Jesus said them, to respond the way he responded. And now we can respond to the things of God. And please God the Father because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. The old is dead and new things have come. Which brings us to our third reality. That's simply this. We have a new identity. We have a new identity. Look at verse 5 with me. Romans chapter 6. Where Paul says this, For if we have become united with him, and we have, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul says that we are permanently identified with the death of Jesus. The old is dead. It's gone. It has no hold. It has no pull on us. And it should have no influence over us, Paul says. But he also says this, just as we identify with the death of Jesus and having died to sin. We also, and there's a strong contrast here, we also shall certainly identify with his resurrection. And when Jesus rose, there was something different about him. I mean, he was still Jesus, and you could still recognize him. His disciples recognized him, but there was something different. You remember in the upper room, the disciples were kind of waiting, trying to figure out what to do, and the door was locked, and they're, they're huddled around the table trying to, you know, just kind of conversing. And then, boom, Jesus just shows up in their midst. The door's locked, and he just, he's there. Well, that's going to be us one day, where these bodies won't be limited by, by barriers or walls or locked doors. We'll be able to move like Jesus moves. When he was on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples, and he was walking with them, and he was explaining the scriptures to them. And they, they begged him to stay, stay the night, and they had dinner. And as he talked about the Old Testament and how it, it, it spoke about him, and their eyes were open, and he just kind of disappeared before their eyes. Well, Paul says one day we're going to be just like this. We're going to be able to identify with that, with the glorified bodies that we will get one day when he returns or we go to be with him. And we won't be hindered by time and by, or by space. We'll be able to eat, excuse me, I'll be able to eat chocolate cake all day in eternity and keep my size 27 waistline. <laughs> Amen. And we'll be able to do amazing things. But we'll be able to recognize one another. And we'll love each other the way Jesus loves us. And we'll care for one another the way Jesus cares for us. Because we will have identified with his resurrection. And it's coming. And this is a future promise in scripture. One day we ourselves will be like he is. Paul tells the church of Corinth this in 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this perishable must put on imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. The Apostle John concurs with Paul in 1 John 3, 2, when he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. One day, you and I are going to exchange these corruptible, temptable, sometimes sinful bodies for a body that is glorious and glorified and incorruptible and without sin forever and ever and ever. 
and we will be just like Jesus. And so this promise is still future, but it's coming. And you know what? We can live like that today. We can live a life that is sin-less. Let me rephrase that. We can live a life where we sin less. Does that make sense? We can never be in this flesh sinless. But we can live lives where we sin less. That's called sanctification. Where the Holy Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus each and every day. And we get a little taste of what it's going to be like to have that resurrection body. It's coming. And that should excite you. Which brings us to our fourth truth that Paul wants us to understand. That we are no longer slaves to sin. Look at verses 6 and 7 with me. Knowing this. Understand, Paul says, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Look at what Paul says. He says, realize this, that the old man, the old nature, that sinful nature that kept us bound and chained to a life of willful sin each and every day, Paul says he's been crucified. You know what happens at crucifixion? Crucifixions? People die. And the old man, the old self, the sin nature, Paul says, has been crucified. God has crucified him. In order that he might be, here's the word, abolished or rendered ineffective or powerless or or, or nullified in our lives so that we no longer live our lives to serve sin. That is so encouraging to me. The old man is dead. God crucified him, Paul says, so that we don't have to be slaves to sin. We're free. But there are times when we choose to, well, get back in the cage. There are times we choose to go back to what was once familiar. But Paul says we are free. We are free from sin. And we can't say the devil made me do it. We can't use Flip Wilson theology. That's a lie. The devil can't make you do anything that you don't want to do. Now, oh, he can tempt you. Don't get me wrong. But you have the ability and the power through the Holy Spirit to say no through the temptation. And if you're wondering, who's Flip Wilson? You, you, you too. It's the 1970s sitcom. But brothers and sisters, we are free from sin. And whatever's got you burdened down, whatever you're struggling with, understand that God has set you free from that. Chuck Swindoll, in his commentary on Romans, makes the following statement. He says, emancipation legally releases a person from involuntary bondage, but it doesn't guarantee that he or she will experience freedom the person must first know that he or she has been released. And this is what Paul is telling us in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. You're free from sin. Sin has no power over you. You are no longer in Adam, but you are in Christ Jesus, who has justified you. And I love what verse 7 says. And here it is literally. It says this. For the one having died, he has been justified permanently from sin. That's us. Free. Forever. 
from the day of salvation to the end of eternity, whenever that ends, and it doesn't. Free from the penalty of sin. Free from the power of sin. You know, when Jesus saved us, he, he did a work in our lives. And sometimes we, re we really don't realize how much he has done. And so our entire salvation is wrapped up in these verses. You see, Jesus justified us by his work on the cross. And he saved us from the penalty of sin, which is an, an eternity in conscious torment in hell. He justified us. But he is also sanctifying us. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit, where we are being made more and more like Jesus each and every day, and we are being saved from the power of sin, where we begin to sin less. Does that make sense? But oh, one day, when we see him face to face, he is going to change us so that we will have bodies just like him. He's going to glorify us. And he will have saved us one day from the very presence of sin. And when we stand before him, there will be no more sin. And we will be unable to sin because of what he's going to do in our lives with glorified bodies. But we can begin to live that life today. Because Paul has told us and has reminded us and then told us again, you are free from sin. We are free. Now go live your lives for Jesus. Amen? Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you that sometimes we don't often grasp what you have told us in your word. But Lord, I pray tonight that as we have seen what Paul has said that we will come to understand that we are truly free from sin, that we can say no to sin. Because you have rendered sin and the pull and the power of sin ineffective in our lives. And so, Lord, help us to realize and to recognize this freedom that we have and help us to actualize it in our lives each and every day so that we get just a little taste of what heaven is going to be like. Jesus, thank you for all that you have done. And may our lives reflect our gratitude. And we ask this, these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Wasn't that a great message? Christ has set us free. We are free indeed. Now let's choose to live in that freedom. Before we end our time this morning, we have a few quick announcements. Next Sunday, June 13th at 9 a.m. is our final Core 4 class. We'll be talking about sharing Christ, so it's a class that you'll want to attend. Email Pastor Greg if you're interested, or just show up. We'll make room for you because this is so important in the life of the believer, learning how to share Christ. So we'll see you at that class next Sunday morning. Then we have something very exciting for you here at Discovery Point Church. Starting June 19th, we will launch Kingdom Man, a six-week discipleship series. Come enjoy breakfast and enjoy fellowship and bonding with other brothers in the body of Christ and just be encouraged in your walk. This is a six-week series that will start June and will end in November. So we hope that you'll plan to attend because it will be a fantastic time of just building relationships with other brothers in the faith as well as elevating your relationship with our Lord. Kids Camp 2021 is fast approaching. July 19th through the 23rd are the dates for that camp. Now this camp is for our children who have completed grades three through six. So if you have a child that has completed grades three through six, you wanna get signed up for this camp. Find out more information by touching base with Angie, or you can email her at angie at discoverypointaz.com.
We'd love to pray for you. And if you have a specific prayer request, submit that online. We pray for all of our prayer requests each week. We lift those names up to the Lord, and we want yours to be among them. And also, thank you so much for your continued giving. It helps us to carry out the mission of Christ here at Discovery Point Church. We're so glad that you worship with us this morning. Have a wonderful week.